Welcome to the Uncut Chronicles. I'm Crystal. I'm Andy. And we are coming to you with information and topics every day, such as culture, trending topics, shit your mammy probably don't need to hear. So come on in with us so we can share more with you about our day. Hey, everybody. I'm Crystal. I'm Andy. And we want to welcome you to another episode of the Uncut Chronicles. Andy, how was your weekend? Look, it was a very emotional weekend. Not emotional. Child, I was in there. <laughs> I just can't do this. Now we crying. Swing Girl, a you know what? It's, it was that Kirk Franklin mini document documentary that he did. Uh-huh. That shit had me so emotional. Like, I, <laughs> and maybe because I'm pregnant, so it was just extra emotional for me. But, um, I feel for him. Like, it, it, you had to be stone cold hearted if you didn't even just feel like a little bit for him sure. and what he was going through in, you know, his whole journey. And if for those of like you who don't know, who probably may or may not have watched it, but um, he kind of did a mini docu- a documentary about him finding out who his real father was 53 years later. Um, his mom told him one man was his dad. He went on believing that. Um, unfortunately, he passed. The father passed away from cancer. Um, but he did get to meet him before he passed. But it yes. just wasn't very much of a connection because they didn't have much time. Right. right. But I also feel like that connection couldn't really spark because I feel like there was still something in him that still kind of felt like, like, I don't know, like, you're my dad, but I don't feel that way. Right. And um, it was a him meeting his real dad night and day different like you could tell. you could hear it in his voice you could tell there was so much empathy and respect in that man's voice and demeanor like it was like this must be your dad because this is the heart that comes across even when Kirk speaks and I felt like this feels like the one mm-hmm. and it was it, and I boohoo cried I, I boohoo cried for that man because I can't imagine you know his already his whole trauma of just being adopted being homeless all of the stuff that he's been through and then you know still trying to heal and trying to find that like missing piece of you like there's something missing in me and he was like it's my dad I just want to be loved I just want my dad and thinking you found that and then you not get that much time with him and then you still feel you know that missing piece and the man that was that missing piece was literally right in front of your face that whole literally time. Literally down the street. Like, right on the... He passes him all the time. The home. It was really, really unfortunate. Um, I feel like another piece of the trauma that goes into his story, if you think about it and look at it and listen, is that his family, the, the lack of communication, the emotions, the pride, uh, like he said for a long time, he was put to the side. He fell, in, he fell through the cracks of this little bitty neighborhood. How did nobody know? And... How they were like, we don't want to talk about this today. Or, you know, I think people forget that if a person's already hurting, to be surrounded by people who want to be stubborn because their own personal choices or just personal beliefs is even more painful. I already think somebody else is my dad. Then I get out here and find out that, oh, you're not going to take the test or you don't want to talk to me because of this. And you're just a byproduct of somebody else's choices. Oh, the pain. And so in watching him and listening to his story, I was just mind blown. I was like, even to this day, the most difficult part is his family. They make it really, really hard. Yes. And in in, almost like the entitlement. Um, and I was having a prior conversation, you know, with about that of just how the intergenerational trauma is. Um, And watching that in his family dynamics of like, you know, his mom wouldn't even acknowledge hardcore. You can't make this shit up. Paternity test. Yeah. DNA 99.99999. All that. She was like, no, that ain't true. Bitch was holding on to the 1%. And I said, ma'am. The disgust. And it was clear as day that this not only is this test scientifically accurate, but you could listen to the cadence of both their, their conversations and their speech. This definitely is this man's father. And so I just thought, this is, you know what? And see, that's why when y'all want to be out here on these fun weekends, you know, skydiving on the D, 
You know what I'm saying? Backing all of it up, put a dick. I, the truth is that look at what came from somebody else making that same choice 53 years ago. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because people still do it today. Or they treat children like checks till it's not fun anymore. You know, and look at how much it's impacted. Every song I feel that he's written, People, I think people don't forget that in order to write music that speaks that deeply to the soul, you have to go through things. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most powerful statements Marvin Sapp has said before was that, he said, people always ask me, when are you going to come out with a new song? You know, I love your music. And he was like, I don't want to. People are always like, what? He said, y'all don't realize what I have to go through in life for these songs to come from my soul. He said, every time I write one, something unimaginable has happened to me and I'm writing it from pain. And you can you imagine trying to tell somebody who in their beautiful little selfish soul, they just want to hear good music that I don't even want to give it to you like that because I got to go through hell to bring it to you. And I don't want to go through hell. You know, think about that with Kirk, his whole life. That's why when he speaks and he says in songs, he tell you who they for. This for the homeless. This for the ones that's broke. <laughs> this for the ones that don't have a parent. This for the ones that's a single mom. He tells you who his music is for mm -hmm. because he has been in all those situations. This man is writing, performed out of pain and suffering and loss for so long. And so I feel like, Oh, there's so much hope in this story for him because I want him to be able to write from a beautiful place of sunshine and peace mm -hmm. because he's given us so much. And so just looking at how these families have been so entitled to benefit off of his back his music, his name, all to snatch it away when he's just simply looking for a piece of peace to find who his biological father was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, he going to have to have a whole new album for this one because he's been re-traumatized and it's difficult. And I say the same thing about everybody going on these weekend trips and vacations, come back pregnant, don't know who the father is. What are you, igniting a new revolution of more Kirk Franklin's? Yes. Yes. We don't want to talk about that part? Yes. Okay. That that's that's literally what's happening. And like you said, it's heartbreaking because and it was so crazy to me. He went through all of that. He just found a DNA test. He hopped in his cart and went to the studio. Broken, tears and all, went to the studio and poured his whole heart out. I said, I don't even know if I can press play on that album because maybe we ain't even gonna make it past the intro the intro to the fucking album. <laughs> Because I know how hurt he was. And to make that album, I, I can't even fathom, like you said, I can't even fathom the pain and the hurt. And it's like, I think we all know albums come from like a deep place. Because what's the first thing we say when we see like one of our favorite musicians go through a heartbreak? Oh, that next album finna slap. That shit finna bust. Because you know how much pain and hurt and emotion is going to go into those albums. But... I, my heart, my heart hurts for him. And it, it was also eye-opening to see that your healing journey is not linear, how people always try to make it seem, especially now in this like weird culture that we're in with social media sometimes where they're like, you know, get a shadow journal, shadow work journal, write this out, take this step, do this step, do this step. And then you should be letting go of the trauma. Baby, my guy, Literally probably thought he was at one, one point is like, I might be healed and got to start all over again at 53 years old. I got to re-heal all of, so probably thought I made a little bit of progress from all the trauma and shit that I had to go through prior. Might have made progress there. Now I got to start all fucking over because I got to re-heal all over and then to rehatch that wound with my mother that I haven't talked to in 23 years. To sit, the first thing she do is sit in front of me and tell me, baby, I don't believe that shit. It's absolutely in fucking sane. And he begged her. He said, the child in me needs you to acknowledge this. And baby girl sat there and said, no, I don't accept this. But then turned around and victimized herself and said, I just don't want to lose you. I, want, I, want, I can't have you. Baby, you had chance after chance. And then this was your big, this was your big one. Your big one to say, I accept this. I take accountability. Now, if you don't remember, cool. 
But keep, be, be real with your shit. You had poor pussy management skills and just be real with your shit and say, hey, baby, I ain't remember this man. We might have dated briefly. I don't know. But if the test say that's your daddy, then that's your motherfucking daddy. And I'm sorry that I led you on a wild goose chase for decades, you trying to figure out who your daddy was. And even in that heartbreak, it was so crazy just to see, like, his mom being so just insufferable and not taking accountability and him in the next scene sitting in front of his son and taking accountability and apologizing. And you could just literally see the son melt in the chair because it's like I you, you can see the freedom it felt because sometimes that's all we want. We just want your parents. I'm sorry. A simple I'm sorry how I made you feel. I know we have stuff to work on, but I'm sorry as a father. I'm sorry. That's literally all Kirk wanted from his mom was, I'm sorry. And she said, Buki, I don't know about none of that shit. But I hope we can still be, we still be besties. No. No, we can't. And I'm like, and it's so crazy to watch that of him having the burden almost to heal that intergenerational trauma because his mother couldn't. But that's that pride. Because, oh, if you find out who your daddy are, I won't be the light of your life anymore. You will no longer just... In her mind, it's probably the way she felt. Like, you already accept the fact that I didn't, you know, hold you, keep you, and raise you as a child, right? And so now this new man comes in, and here he is, blindsided himself. I, I really feel for the man because he had no clue. And now she's going to feel bad. Because it means deep down inside, you know you slept with him but didn't want to say nothing and never wanted to tell me here he is still here living and breathing across the street. And so she's scared that Kirk, it just came across that she's scared that Kirk is going to be angry at her and that the new gentleman that he never knew was his dad will be viewed as more of an archangel because here you are unknowing and now you're willing to do all the things that you can possibly do. And so for her, it's pride. Yes. It's fear. How selfish can you be? It's not about you. It's never about you. I don't care if a man pays $3 for child support. That $3, as crappy or shitty as it may be, is what it is. But that has nothing to do with a person not being able to see their child, not being able to take them fishing to the park, all the freebies, mm. okay? Because being a parent doesn't have to be as expensive as what we've made it to be. Right. A lot of people grew up with parents who were just cashiers in grocery stores, mm. janitors, very basic jobs, didn't have a lot of money, may have barely been able to make the bills, but they were excellent parents because they were involved, they were hands-on, they were there. I really feel like Kirk would have had a very different life had his mother just been honest and to be shipped around to different relatives to then those relatives not be, you know, able to do as much for him as maybe he would have desired mm -hmm. to be homeless, looking for food. Like, you just can't make it up. It's still happening to this very day. People are still making these same choices. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we really need to talk about that. What are the qualities of a good parent? What does good parenting look like? How do you choose based on good character and not just good body, yada, yada, yada? Like, because that's really what people are doing. People are having a good time, judging a book by its cover. You're not thinking shit about it. And you haven't looked at any of the pages in the book to check out their character. I really feel like... um it's just a never-ending cycle if you don't watch it. And I'm so glad he apologized to his son. You could hear and see the relief in his body and in his soul because for so long, the son has been so angry. But my question I always had is, how come nobody's ever asked, what is he angry about? Y'all just want to hear that his son is talking crazy, cussing people out, he mad at his daddy. Has anybody said, what's made you so angry? Mm. So then he could just give words to his feelings. Because people aren't angry for no reason. Listen to what hurt them, you know. And then from there, we can move forward. So now it makes so much more sense. Because if his son is angry and hurt, you know the daddy, Kirk, is, was angry and hurt. So he probably did hurtful things at some point. Um, and so it's just so sad to see multiple generations of people go through such pain. It is. It, and that's why I think it was just... Like, uplifting for me, at least towards the end. At least to see he making attempts to try to redirect that course so it doesn't happen again in his son. And he admitted, like, a little bit in and down, he said, hurt people hurt people. Yep. And, you know, his mother hurt him, and essentially he hurt his son in being hurt. And at first, like, I, 
I can admit I was a little skeptical at first because I'm like, what does you having to tell your son like this, like, you know, trying to bring y'all together over you finding out who your father, I felt like it was like a ploy instead of just saying, I want to talk to you and reconciliate with you. And at first I was getting all skeptical, but I think now watching it, I was like, okay, because it, to me, it kind of made sense now. Now I see why you probably, like you said, we don't really know the real reason why his son was so angry, but it gave a little more light to why you are the way you are. And I'm like, even for me, like I could kind of relate to that on a personal level because like, you know, my my mom opened up to me about some stuff and I was like, bitch, had I probably known this about you? I think that was in the moment I viewed my mom as human. Sure. I humanized her. And I I felt for her as a woman. And I was like, I think in him saying that to his son, I think it was humanizing his father and looking at his father as not just like my dad, but as a man and what you were going through and why maybe in those moments you couldn't show up for me when I needed you to show up for me. But um, like you said, we'll never know. The real reason, I'm pretty sure... There is a reason, like you said, but I don't know if we'll ever know the full extent of why he was mad at his dad. And I know, it, I think it had a little bit to do with his sexuality, because um, if I'm not mistaken, his son was on a, like, um, reality show, mm -hmm. and majority of the men were gay. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he, they were, que they kept questioning him about his sexuality, and he wouldn't come out and directly answer what his sexuality was. Mm -hmm. However... Um, it was perceived because they would say, like, you're on a show full of gay men. Buki, um, hello. W what's going on with sexuality? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I think that might have been part of, right. you know, his fallout with his father. But um, I really do hope that after this, there's there's reconciliation and there's healing between him and his son. Because, like, even looking at it, and I was like, I don't think we understand how big of a role fathers play in our lives. And I have a conversation with my partner because his father died when he was three. And um, I had, a, like, an absent present parent where my parent was in the household, but my parent was never home. And um, I would always ask him, I said, what do you think sometimes is worse? Not having a father or having a father that's absent present? And we would go back and forth. And he said, sometimes I feel like having an absent present father. He said, because you yearn for that, you know, relationship, that time with the father and you can't have and he's right there versus, you know, from my perspective, not having a father, you can't miss something you never had. And I was like, damn, I don't think we just realize sometimes how big of a role fathers play um, in our lives. And, you know, just like you were saying earlier, where I can't tell you shit that my father bought me. I can't remember shit that he bought me, but I can remember all the time that he spent with me that was free 99. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people, like you said, people understand that where we place almost like monetary value on parenting, where it's like, if you're not buying your kid the latest Jordans, if you're not taking your kid on five-star trips, then you're not a good parent. Where your kid will literally like remember the smallest little quality time y'all did remember when we sat in the bed and we watched the movie together and we laughed so hard versus us going back and forth about you know buying a fucking coat but anywho i really really love that documentary and if you haven't seen it please watch that documentary like you gotta be saying if you get at least like Get a little choked up. You get the salty little, little taste heart, in your mouth. Heart strings. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think we might have to do a part two on this conversation. There's another piece of it I think that we haven't even touched on. But, you know, at the Uncut Chronicles, we are here and we are always bringing you things that are live and uncut. And so we're going to talk more about this. I'm Crystal. I'm Andy. And we're always talking about things that, you know, shit your mama can't hear. Peace, y'all. Oh, bye, guys. The Uncut Chronicles is part of the Breaking Ice, Building Bridges community podcast platform brought to you by Possibilities.